look at distractions, and distractions are everywhere. They are ubiquitous. They are literally everywhere. You don't even have to look for distractions, and they're just going to always be pulling for you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to distract you. We're gonna, I'm going to put a famous face on the screen, and if you recognize who this is, just shout out this person's name, okay? Are you with me? All right, just shout. See if you can be the first one, all right? I got a quote from this guy. Three, two, one. Who is this? Jim, Jim Carrey. How many knew that? Okay, all right, good. Jim Carrey made a quote recently that floored me. It was so good, it actually made it into this message. He says this. He says, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so that they can see it's not the answer. A man who has the world at his fingertips, a man who could fill any void he thinks he has with anything the world has to offer. And even he has come to the realization that they are nothing but fleeting distractions. And there it is. There it is, right there. The distractions of this world will do all they can to try to take our eyes off of our first love. And if you were the enemy, wouldn't you? Wouldn't that be your tactic? It is so genius. If we do not make a purposeful choice an intentional choice to deny the ever-growing appetites that try to destroy our walk with the Lord, it won't happen. It is not natural. You know what I'm saying? To quote the great theologians known as Slash and Axel Rose, we must avoid the appetite for destruction. <laughs> it is a real thing. It is, it is everywhere. Distractions will take your attention and will take it off, and we have to be intentional. Hear me. Curbing our appetites for destruction do not, do not come naturally. Can I get an amen? amen. All you have to do to see if this is true is drive by Krispy Kreme when that hot now sign is on. It is. The struggle is real. When you want to turn in so bad you can't, you're like, I can't do it. No. This, just simple appetites like that. They are every, welcome to the jungle, baby. Distractions are every, oh, you caught that. Okay. All right. They are everywhere and they are pulling for our attention. In fact, it's even at church. That's why we do all we can, even during worship, to minimize distractions. That's why we put up curtains, right? So that we don't watch every single person that has to get up and go to the nursery or go to the bathroom or have an endless parade to check whatever it is they need to go to. We put up curtains for that. Or we, we put up signs and notices before church that say things like, silence your cell phone, all right? Make sure, y'all probably should check that right now. Make sure your cell phone's out. Or we, or we say it's not a good time to be surfing for Craigslist or eBay. This, that's not, go do that elsewhere. That's not what this is for. This isn't time for catch up on conversations. We're here to worship God and to tune out those distractions, to jettison those things. Because distractions, I promise you, are everywhere. And they take our focus off of one thing to put it on another. And that's a simple definition for distraction. One meme I saw this week as I was researching this is beautiful. It said this, beware the weapons of mass distraction. Is that not beautiful? In fact, I would add a couple to that, like Netflix, Hulu, Crackle, Sparkle, Pop, all these different things that are out there. I would add those. Now, here's the deal. None of these are evil. Technology in and of itself is not evil. In fact, I use some of these each and every day for the church to advance the kingdom. So hear me. This is not evil. There is no war on technology. You know what the problem is? It's me. The problem is when I allow these things to get out of their proper place. When I allow them to start creeping into and slowly crowding out the more important aspects of my life, I've fallen for the trap of the enemy. When I am at dinner with my family and I'm so disengaged from them and I'm only more concerned with this, bad man. When the first thing I reach for when I wake up isn't my Bible, but it's to see how many notifications I have, bad man. And it is everywhere. It is so easy to fall in. In fact, let, let me show you what I mean. Just seven days ago, there was a little tiny football game. Go Eagles. A little tiny game called the Super Bowl. It's not as impressive or as fun as the national championship, Roll Tide, but it is a very important illustration because at halftime, there was a little guy named Justin Timberlake that did a halftime show. 
And what he did about halfway through is he got off the stage and he ran up the stadium stairs and went into the crowd. He went into the crowd and stopped and just happened to make little 12-year-old boy beside him, Ryan McKenna, an overnight star. And when he got there, he started singing with it. And what does this 12-year-old boy do naturally? Well, you get out your cell phone and you take a selfie, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. I would have done the same thing. Well, first I probably would have Googled who is Justin Timberlake. But then I would have taken, I would have taken a selfie, right? You know what I'm talking about. But what happened next was so ironic. And it trended. And it took the world by storm. In the few precious moments that little sweet Ryan McKenna had, to interact with one of his heroes, to interact with this living legend, and he is a legend. I give him that. I got nothing against JT. We go way back. But this is, this is, this is so illustrative. Be ready, okay? This is going to blow your mind. In this moment, Ryan McKenna could have interacted with him or shared these, pre- these precious fleeting seconds, but instead, Ryan McKenna was doing this. And this. And that. The few seconds, y'all, that speaks volumes. That is powerful. And lest we think we're only talking about the 12-year-old younglings, we're not just talking about the Padawan learners. This is adults, too. We do this. It's Valentine's Day. When you're out with your little sweetie, I'm going to give you a little fun test. Just look around during your little dinner and see how much you're seeing this. Now, you might not see as much on Valentine's Day because that's just a recipe for disaster. We all know. But maybe any other time. It is amazing what you see. In fact, it it brings up a beautiful question. What is the point of being afraid of the zombie apocalypse when you're already a zombie? (laughs) Do you see that? It's here. (laughs) Look around you, Ellen. This This is the zombie apocalypse. We look at this and I think, how do we avoid this? What does God's word possibly have to say? Oh, it is so deep. It is so powerful. We're going to look at one of the shortest passages that is so jammed packed full of truth and and a call to holiness. Here is your warning. We've laughed a little bit, but buckle up Dixie cup because this is so powerful. Turn with me to 1 John. Open your Bibles or pull up your favorite Bible app. While you do that, let me welcome our online campus. We have a lot of people who are at home this week recovering from the flu and from surgeries. God bless you. We're praying for you and uh, hope you get back soon. Last week, we looked at what love was, and we dove deep into agape love, and that was what love is. Today, we're going to look at what love is not, and real love is not distractible. Real love is not a cheap counterfeit. John says this. In 1 John 2, verse 15, read along. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Yikes. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, these are not of the Father but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Wow. The Apostle John is warning us against losing our first love. So let me ask right away, how cold is your love? Has it grown cold? Are you red hot? Are you on fire? He's saying on this first love, don't fall in love with anything that is in the world that takes your eyes off the greater thing and puts it on lesser things. These don't have to be evil things. Hear me. They can even be good things, but they are distractions from the greatest thing. Does that make sense? He's talking about, look at the very first verse, verse 15. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. I got to be honest, the first time I read this, I was probably a teenager. And I remember thinking, well, this is weird. Because what's the first verse we are all taught in VBS and stuff? John 3, 16, right? What does it say? It says, for God so loved the the world. So I'm thinking, all right, for God so loved the world, we're supposed to love the world, God loves the world. And all of a sudden, 1 John says, "Ah, don't you love the world? (laughs) And my little young skull full of mush is is short-circuiting. It doesn't quite get it. I'm like, well, I'm supposed to love the world, but yet God died for it. And yet John said, don't you love the world? There's something going on. So therefore, we have to, what in the world does the word world mean, right? Say that three times fast. What does this, world has different meanings in Scripture. In fact, there's three of them John highlights right here. I want to look at this because this is so cool. In the Bible, the word world is used to describe three different things. In the broadest sense, it means this, the world of creation. 
You see this all over. You see it in Acts. You see it. This is talking about the stars, the cosmos, the planets, things like that, okay? That's the world of creation. It's not what John's talking about here. Then there's another time it's used. It can refer to the world of humanity. And this is that time what we just talked about, John 3, 16. This is the humankind, for God so loved you, and God so loved I, you and I type thing, okay, humanity. But then there's something else the Bible refers to when it says world, and that is what we're talking about. It is the world system. The world system here, which, make no mistake, aligns itself with Satan and tries to oppose everything Christ stands for. And that's what John is warning us about. This evil world system that tries to hamper and destroy our fellowship with the Father. You don't hear this preached much in America because we have so much affluence and so many good things going on and we're so fat, happy, and content that we think of the world as great and things are fine. But he goes on in verse 15 to clarify. He says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And if that's not strong enough, Go on and read in James and Romans where it says that loving the world is actually a sign, quite possibly, that the love of the Father has never been in you. Y'all, that's frightening. That is, this message is so needed, not just then, but 2,000 years later today. Don't fall in love with the fleeting pleasures of the world at the expense of your first love. If I could sum up everything what John's trying to say here, this world and all the distracting shiny trinkets and baubles and bangles and look over here and jazz hands and things. Not really sure what jazz hands has to do with this, but I love doing this. It's just like, like, look over here, right, right? No, no, don't pay attention to this. Look over here, distractions, flashing neon signs. Verse 16, John goes on to say even something else. He explains how the world system operates using three very specific behaviors. Three behaviors that, Let's be honest, if you want to be a mature dis a disciple, you got to knock these out. These are the three behaviors that we are supposed to avoid and keep in check at all times, at all costs. So before we read them, let me ask, how you doing with these? Because this is powerful, because John uses a word we don't like. It's the L word. It's not love. It's lusts. What is that? Well, if you're a little fuzzy on what lust is, you can break it down and boil it down to its essence. And it simply means this. Lust is a desire or an inward temptation or, don't miss this, simply wanting one's own way. Kind of reminds me of Lucifer in the beginning. I could be like God. I could sit on the throne on high I could, I could do, I, I want to be like him. And all he wanted was his own way to start with. And it is so slippery, the slope that we go down. And the first one he mentioned specifically is the lust of the flesh. Oh, doesn't it just sound like, oh, like we just like, need to take a shower after saying it. The lust of the flesh. These are our appetites. Now, immediately when we see this, we think we hear the word lust of the flesh, and almost all of us have one particular sin in mind, right? You know what I'm talking about. And, and, that is absolutely in this warning, the sexual things. But that, we're doing a huge disservice, church, if we limit just this to just that. Because there are other appetites that come. Things that are not bad in and of themselves, but they get out of control. We do ourselves a disservice if we think about this is all God is warning us about. It is not just about the sexual things. God made us with other needs like food and water and shelter and comfort. And what happens, the devil comes along and exploits these against us. And it is so slippery. For instance, we all need food. There's nothing wrong with food. It was created for us to be used to sustain us, to nourish us. There's nothing wrong with that. But what happens is it can get out of control and we overeat. And we begin to cause ourselves our own problems and health concerns. Some of us may drink too much. Others may engage in behaviors that soon become addictions. And then they dominate us. That's what John is talking about. Things that were once simply meant to sustain us now become our master. And that is a powerful difference. Understand John's warning here. This can happen to anyone. Let me show you how this can happen to anyone. Just last week, I'm in my office with my beautiful, innocent, precious little Mercy Hope, little Mercy Mercy, and I'm sitting here feeding her. We're having a great time. How could this possibly ever give in to the lust of the flesh? Let me show you. I'm eating hash browns from the health store known as McDonald's. And as I'm, as I'm eating these hash browns and I'm having a great time, I look up and Mercy's just got like a little bit of drool right here. She's like, 
And I'm like, oh, you don't want this. You don't need to open this can of worms, sweetie. She goes, she's learning sign language because we do baby sign time. She goes, please? Oh. Right? It's like, pfft. I'm like, what do you want, baby? Up to half my kingdom. What would you want, <laughs> right? And she's like, more? She knows this means more. And I'm like, oh, you want a little bit of hash brown? Here you go, a little bit of hash brown. I go back to eating it. She goes, more? Momo, Momo, Momo. I'm like, oh, you want some more? This is cute. Oh, man, I've woken the beast. And I start feeding her. She's like, Momo, Momo, please, please, Momo. And I give her more. Give her. Y'all, I'm kidding you. Not. She doesn't even swallow. She is stuffing them in her cheeks like a chipmunk. It's like, mm-hmm. and I'm looking at her. I'm almost laughing because it's funny for now. And I've given her more. And I'm like, more? She's like, Momo, Momo, please. And it's all puffed up. And I'm like, would you swallow your food? You have enough. Oh, this is deep. You have sufficient amount, sweetie. You ha- would you just swallow your food? You are about to choke. I look at Amy. I'm like, what is wrong with your daughter? What, <laughs> what is her malfunction? Look at this. She's all puffed up like a chipmunk. I want more and more. And I'm like, that's it. I didn't have to teach her that. We all, we got to hold our appetites in check. Literally. This is incredible. It was so beautiful. I got to go on. John warns us next about the lust of the eyes. Woo! These are our acquisitions. The lust of the eyes. These are the deadly sins we always hear about that we kind of like laugh. We like greed and envy and arrogance and extravagance and all these things. Now, we live in a materialistic age, and it is so easy for us to make a quick purchase, swipe, click, boop, 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 and have it delivered to our doorstep sometimes. Maybe even with a drone now. Anything we want, we have the power to purchase it, right? You got the money, you got the time, boom, it is right there. Everything is at your fingertips. It is harder now to deny the encroaching lust of the eyes than ever. There are so many things that try to pull at us. Now remember, possessions are temporary, okay? Hold them loosely. One of the most powerful things that Pastor Steve taught me probably 15 years ago, hold things loosely. Allow them, allow God to give them and allow him to pass them on. And it resonated with me. Now, hear me. Suffice it to say, it is not necessarily wrong to have things. It is not necessarily wrong to have things. It's wrong when the things have you. And there is such a huge difference here. When the things that you are striving for and the things that you, I got to work harder. I got to work longer. I got to do another day. Gotta do, I got to go do this. I've earned this. And, and soon the things you're working for now have you. And you start feeling these bands around you, like, I'm feeling kind of trapped. And I look at my statement, I'm like, oh my goodness, I've got to do, I can't afford this. And I just swiped that card in that $5,000 gold card limit. And they sent me another one. Surely I have the money. And all suddenly I'm down this road and I look around and I can't even breathe. And I wonder how I got here. Sound familiar? Hello, Financial Peace University. It's incredible. And it happens slippery slope, just a little bit. The devil didn't show up at your door and say, boom, buy a Lamborghini. It wasn't like that. It was subtle. It was like, you want to finance that Outback steak at 28% over the next 10 years? Swipe the card. Well, if they had asked me that, I would have taken her to McDonald's instead of Outback. I wouldn't have said, I'm going to finance this, and this meal is going to cost me $1,962 as I spread it. See what I'm saying? This is is so, here's the deal. And I'm just going to mention this, and then we're going to move on, because this is a whole different sermon, okay? This is not here about materialism or anything like that. came up with a little test, and it was inspired by the great prophetess, the great theologian that simply goes by one name, Elsa. And I call this test the let it go test. If you're not sure if things have too much of a hold on you, try this when you get home. Walk through your house, walk through your garage, walk through your closet, walk through your man cave, Walk through your shed and just randomly point to something. Make it easier, do this. (laughs) Just say, bingo. And then look what you pointed at. And then ask yourself this simple question. Would it devastate me if I had to let it go? What a simple test. If you really want to be spiritual, ask yourself this. If the Lord, for whatever reason, asked me to let this go, could I do it? Would I do it? Pretty simple test. You'll know real quick what things really have a hold on you. Are you willing at any moment 
I mean, I think there's a story somewhere in the Old Testament about a father and a son having to, am I willing to, well, now it just gets real. This is, this is serious discipleship. Man, this cost Jesus everything to buy us back from sin and the grave. This is powerful stuff. Then John warns us about the pride of life. Oh, I love this. These, David Jeremiah calls this the approval rating syndrome. When we're so concerned about this unhealthy, almost narcissistic desire to be recognized, this, this desire to, to, you know, and we associate this with wealthy people or people of high position, you know, like governors and presidents and things like that. No, 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 no. This can be as simple as wanting someone to recognize us and maybe to give off the appearance that we are important. You see how subtle that is? To maybe give the appearance that we have something they don't, and maybe, just maybe, it flares up a tiny bit of envy in someone else or jealousy. When I looked at this and I was researching that this week, I pushed back from my desk and I shook my head and I almost chuckled. You know why? Because it took me back to middle school, right? This is, I mean, this is, it would be funny if it weren't so sad. These are the same petty, silly stuff that we cared about in middle school. Oh, I'm going to sit at the cool table. <laughs> Look at you. You're not sitting at the cool table. It's like, have we drifted no farther as adults? And some of us are still stuck on approval rating, the pride of life for people to recognize us. And I was thinking, wow. And then it hit me. Living for the approval of others is exhausting. It is exhausting. When you can get to the place where you care more about what he thinks than what anyone else thinks, you have found true freedom. And it is beautiful. Let me ask you, I'm going to put it into today's modern lingo because I see some younglings in here today. Let me ask you this. When your head hits the pillow at night, what would you rather hear? Okay, this will, this is so you can relate. Would you rather hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Or are we more concerned with how many likes and shares our social media posts got? Wow. What does your heart beat for? It'll reveal a lot. Powerful stuff. You know what's amazing to this? Here's, here's some more mind-blowing stuff. When I look at John's warnings, these are the same exact techniques that the devil has used from the beginning. Think about this. Go back to Genesis 3. Adam and Eve. She saw that the fruit was good. First thing, boom, right through the eyes. Saw it. Saw it, lusted for it, wanted it. Not necessarily a bad way, but just looks kind of neat and enticing. It was simple. Remember, the devil didn't show up and go, worship Satan. It wasn't like that. It's like, yeah, did God really say you can't have that? Come on. It just, you know, it looks good. It does look good. Who doesn't like pomegranates or apples or whatever it was? Scripture doesn't say. God made it. You see how easy this is to rationalize this, to justify this? This is, this is incredible. And then fast forward 4,000 years, the devil shows up to Jesus himself, the Son of God, in Luke 4, and he starts offering all these temptations. It's the same ones. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, bow down, all this will be yours. It's his anyway, but the devil's still throwing it out like a temptation. Then fast forward 2,000 more years, and it's the same silly tactics he's using today, those three. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. And we don't hear this talked about anymore, and it's so sad because the devil, all he has to do, oh, this is so good. All he has to do is to get us to turn just slightly off our course. It doesn't have to be a 180-degree turn for him to have a victory. When I learned this this week, this, this was, this was mind-blowing. Think about this. If I'm heading towards that door where that exit sign is, and I'm heading, doo -doo 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 -doo, and he gets me distracted just slightly there, and I walk over here by Nathan, if I keep going, at the end of the day, I am a mile off course. No longer am I at the door. And then all of a sudden, I look around and I say, what happened? How did I get here? It was not a big shift. It was a subtle change of course. Just a little distraction. Just a little skipping reading my Bible. Just a little partying. Just a little, you insert your temptation, whatever. And all of a sudden, remember the devil didn't show up in a big red suit with horns and go, ha, ha, sacrifice a goat. It wasn't like that. We would have seen that, and we would have said, oh, you're the devil. You're not fooling me. <laughs> I can see you. It was subtle. Little slippery slopes. Oh. You know, it's Valentine's Day this week, so I wanted to share just a little famous story about an infamous couple. 
a couple that we should not emulate. But it's a famous couple nonetheless, simply known as Samson and Delilah. I wanted to give you a little romance story to send you on your week. You all know the story. Oh, Delilah. Oh, Delilah. The temptress hired by the enemies of God to basically seduce a good man, to seduce Samson, whom unfortunately was starting to apparently feel very confident in himself and confident in the spirit that dwelt with him from time to time. Right, this is before the Holy Spirit took up breath. It's before Jesus. So we have this incredible setup here. And she comes in and says, tell me the secret of your strength. Well, if you tie me up with these ropes, <laughs> I'll be just like any other man. Really? And then she goes and does this to him. He falls asleep, wakes up. She's like, Samson, wake up. The Philistines are upon you. And he's like, what? <laughs> oh, I'll kill him. You know? And he goes on. She comes back and she has the audacity to be mad and say, you're mocking me. Tell me where your strength lies. And do you see what Samson's doing? He's giving in a little by little. He's just flirting with the temptation. He hasn't gone and said, oh, evil seductress. <laughs> he hasn't said anything like that. He is, he, he is just going a step at a time. Chad Ashby, he's a pastor who, who talked about this. He likened it to a fishingman fisherman thing. I love this. This is, this is a, a fish I caught the other day. This is a, this is a uh, dolphin. And, all right, it's a lure. I know this much. And he said, what happens is there's this little bit of bait on the hook. And it's almost like Delilah throws it out and reels in Samson. And Samson sees it. And he's like, oh, this looks fun and cuddly. Cute little fish with giant hooks. And he bites on it, and he doesn't even realize the sharp stick of the hook is in him. And what makes it worse? As he's being reeled in, he almost, it's like he enjoys the fight. Like, I can, I can, I can quit any time. I can, oh, I can quit any time. I got this under control. And he doesn't even realize he's going closer and closer towards danger. He's bitten in the hook, and he doesn't even get it. He's thinking, at any moment, I can quit this. I can quit this. I'm strong. I can break these bonds any time. And for two more times, he does. She ties him up with different methods. And then each time, she wakes him up, Samson, the Philistines are here. Wake up. Defend yourself. Okay. And he breaks his bonds, and he goes. I don't know what he does. I don't know if he kills him or beats him or whatever. But all I know is Delilah gets mad, and she goes for the death blow on this next one. And she goes for his heart. Read what happens next. She says, how can you say I love you when your heart isn't with me? You have mocked me these three times, and you've not told me where your great strength lies. And when she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. Dramatic much? This is, this is a girl. Woman, if you keep... Beg, you just say, my soul is vexed to death. This was wearing him down. And guess what he does? And he told her all his heart. Let's be honest. In this moment, do you think Samson woke up and said, today is a great day to betray my Nazarite vow to the Lord. I will confess all to a Philistine temptress who doesn't even love me, who's using me, and I will cash in everything I ever loved. There's no way. And neither would you, and neither would I. But this is exactly what we do when we go step by step towards a distraction that is not good for us. Do you see the warnings? Do you see why John says, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh? Man, don't give in to the pride of life. So we have a lesson. Samson had multiple times to turn back. At any moment, he could have renounced Delilah. He could have rebuked sin. He could have returned to the Lord. But he didn't. He chose to ignore every warning sign. When she said, now tell me, you, if you love me, you'll do it. And you know what he does? And the warning signs are going off and the sirens are blaring. He does this. La, 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 la. I can't hear it. <laughs> All I see is that pretty girl. Me likey. He didn't say that, but that's modern. And he goes headlong down it. And he's just talking to himself. What? I can quit any time. I'm strong. I'm Samson. Come on. I can break those bonds. And then one time, it doesn't happen the way he thinks. <sighs> Samson tells Delilah all about his Nazarite vow, confesses about his uncut hair and where his strength comes, and then he lays down to sleep one more time 
in the den of a dragon, in the lap of danger and sin and destruction. And he doesn't even have a clue how close to danger he is. Read what happens next. She does, she says, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and he says, hey, no problem. I'll go out just like every other time and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Wow. Chad Ashby, he calls this possibly the saddest verse in all the Bible. That last part. But he didn't know that the Lord had left him until it's too late. He goes, something. He had, he had so seared his conscience. He had so flirted with temptation and taken that spirit for granted that he was blinded. And he wakes up, he couldn't even see that the Lord was nowhere to be found. Y'all, oh, that is terrifying to me. What a tragic warning. The consequences of sin are brutal. You know what happens next? He gets captured, becomes a slave. They put him in Gaza, makes him do all kinds of hard labor, and then they gouge out his eyes. What? They gouge out his eyes. This is crazy because sin has consequences. This is such a powerful, God's warnings will have to get louder and clearer. And you want to know what the most tragic irony of this whole story is? Think about this. When when Samson was blinded, he finally saw most clearly. How sad is it? It took him being blinded for him to finally see clear again. When he could no longer see and have those lust of the eyes and lust of the flesh for Delilah. When that was removed, only then could he return back to the Lord. And we know how the story ends with a happy ending. He grows his hair again and everything's great and he goes and he becomes a successful judge. (laughs) Oh wait, that's not him. He dies with one last sacrifice. Takes a lot of bad guys with him. It is a horribly tragic reminder. God has given us guardrails, church. He has given us disciplines. And these warnings from 1 John to say, Don't look to the left or the right. You stay on the straight and narrow. You are called to be a special people. You are called to walk in holiness. Wow, how are you doing with that? You are now going to be my ambassadors to a lost and dying world. Gulp. (laughs) Me? You? Yeah. That's what the church does. This is incredible. He tries to save us from our own destruction. God's discipline is not pleasant, but it's right. And he, as he shows us here, in fact, if I can leave you with this encouraging verse in Hebrews 3.13, it says this, brothers and sisters, encourage one another daily, as long as you have today, so that none of you may be hardened by the sin deceitfulness. That is so good and so powerful. Let us encourage one another and say, hey, man, don't give in. Hey, I think your heart's getting hardened to this. Or man, hey, brother, you may have a blind spot about this. Do you realize how close you're getting to the danger? You are tiptoeing right up to the edge. I just wanted to pull you back, just privately. I didn't even know if you were aware. I kind of hope you were, but if not, one brother to another, can I help you out? Wow. You don't think this is powerful? In the jungles of Africa, hunters have devised the most genius and devious way to trap monkeys. It is so simple, and it works almost every time. And guess what? Not a shot is fired. No blood is shed. What they do is they take a coconut, which a monkey likes, they cut it in half, and inside this hollowed out coconut, they put an orange. They peel just a little bit of the orange and squeeze some of that beautiful citrus scent all over it, and then they fasten the shells back together. And they take and they cut a little hole in the end of the coconut, just barely big enough for the empty hand of the monkey to slide in and grab the orange. And they take that coconut and they tie it back up to the tree. And then the hunters do this. They retreat back into the shadows of the jungle and they wait because the trap is set. In fact, it's already a sure thing. That monkey, so innocent, not looking to die, swings around, goes, whoa, I smell an orange. What's that? And he comes over and he looks inside that tiny hole and he sees what he wants and his mouth waters. He says, that looks good to me. And he thrusts his hand inside and he grabs the orange and it is every bit as delicious as he thought it was going to be. He could smell it. He squeezes it. And then he tries to pull it out. And he can't. Because that orange, with that fist wrapped around it, will never fit through that tiny hole. And that is the point. And he frantically pulls against it. At any moment, he could let go, but he doesn't. 
He wants that so bad. Now he has fallen prey. And he's pulling and he's pulling. And as he's yanking hard on, trying to get this to come and be his, very quietly, the hunters, without him even knowing it, are sneaking up behind him with a net. And they drop it over him, and it's done. How tragic for that monkey who is looking at something that in and of itself is not a bad thing. Pastor Matt is not anti-orange. But the orange was used to get him distracted, and he never saw the enemy coming up behind him. Wow. And the devil does that today. How tragic. This poor monkey could have saved his own life if he had just let go of that temptation, of that simple, innocent thing. But he didn't. He didn't realize that he can't have that and freedom. Oh, oh, church, that'll preach. He didn't realize it, and it was right there. That delicious orange now became a deadly distraction. So let me ask you this. What distraction are you holding on to? What temptation is it that you need to let go of today? What addiction has gotten its arms wrapped around you, and you need to let it go. Let's do it today. Let me pray with you. God, I thank you for your presence in this place. Lord, I am asking that you would break addictions, that you would break struggles and tear down strongholds of the enemy. Lord, forgive us for the simple trifles and baubles and bangles that are shiny and distract us from doing the greater work. Lord, if there's anything that has come between us and our first love, we confess it to you. We pray that you would take it away. We sacrifice it right at the foot of the cross. God, we pray that you would cleanse us now, that you would make us white as snow, that you would show us the better road. Lord, we turn loose of that orange, and we pray that you would break any bonds that are tying us back and holding us down. We invite you here, Holy Spirit. You are welcome in this place. Do what only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.